Okay, so welcome to unit six. This is where we introduce the concept of the earthquake response spectrum. Here, we begin to apply the theory of structural dynamics that we've learned so far to develop practical tools which help guide the seismic design process. The unit will consist of three sections. In the first, we'll introduce the complexities of earthquake response and use that to motivate the need for response spectra. In the second, we'll introduce the underlying concepts of the response spectrum, which is a way to describe structural responses to a specific ground motion event. And finally, in the third section, we'll introduce design spectra, which are similar to response spectra, but are used to generally describe possible future ground motion responses. So let's start with a brief introduction to earthquake response. Ground motions are measured through an accelerograph, sometimes called a seismometer. These are electronic instruments which measure either ground acceleration or ground velocity. These are much easier quantities to measure than ground displacement. And for the entirety of this unit, we will focus on measured ground accelerations. Now in the picture, you see a variety of measured ground motions in terms of acceleration in Gs. And these are all drawn to scale. And immediately you observe the wide variety of possible ground motions that we can observe. These will depend not just on the characteristics of the earthquake, but also on the location where the, they were measured. Some, such as a ground motion record from the 1994 Northridge earthquake measured very close to the fault, can look very much like a pulse-like signal. Whereas others, such as one from the Coina 1967 earthquake, can be very short with very high frequency fluctuations and some, like the one from Mexico City 1985, can be very long with very low frequency, high period fluctuations. In the particular case of the Me Mexico City record, this happened to be the case because the local soil conditions at the measurement location were actually very soft. So the big picture question here is, how do we simplify structural responses to such a wide variety of possible ground motions and loading functions? And ultimately, how do we inform the design of structures which can be subject to these types of loadings? In order to develop an effective framework, we need to make some assumptions. So let's start by assuming that we know the ground acceleration. Let's also assume that we're dealing with linear elastic structures. And finally, let's assume that the ground motion record is completely independent from the structural response. In other words, there is no soil structure interaction. With these assumptions in place, we can now bring in the tools that we developed for single degree of freedom dynamic analysis. So let's quickly review the equation of motion for a single degree of freedom structure undergoing ground motion. This is the case on the right. If you recall, that structure could be described in terms of three quantities. The ground motion, UG, the relative displacement of the structure, U, and the total displacement of the structure, UT. Now in unit three, we looked at how to describe an equivalent structure on the left, which is a fixed base with an applied force and a relative displacement only. And that is the equation that we derived here. Now the important thing to recall is that we expressed the effective force as a function of the ground acceleration u double dot g. We can take this one step further and divide out by m in order to get an equation that is completely free of any physical parameters and is expressed entirely in terms of 
the ground motion, the damping ratio, and the natural frequency. This will be important because we want to generalize beyond systems with specific mass, stiffness, and damping. Now, assuming we know the ground acceleration as well as the natural period and damping of a structure, then its displacement response, U, can simply be found via numerical methods like we discussed in the previous unit. So here we have some example responses to the El Centro ground motion. Let's focus on that first column on the left. All right. So in this case, damping is held constant at 2%. And we vary the period of the structure from 0.5 seconds to 2 seconds. Now the first thing I want you to notice is that in this analysis, we don't care what the structure actually looks like. In other words, if we take the case of Tn equal to 1, this would imply, of course, that omega n is equal to pi. And this could be true of a heavily loaded stiff structure. such as a brace frame with a lot of cargo, or it could be true of a very lightly loaded flexible structure, such as a antenna tower. In this case, the only thing that matters is that the ratio of M to K remain the same. The second thing you should notice is that the response time history is quite sensitive to the natural period of the structure. We notice that as the period goes up, the maximum displacement shown by the circle not only gets larger, but also happens later in time. Now let's jump over to the second column. In this case, the period is fixed and damping is varied from 0 to 5 percent. We notice that in this case, as we vary the damping, there's also observable changes in the response time history. But in this case, as the damping goes up, our observed maximum displacement goes down. These are general trends, but they will depend heavily on the characteristics of the ground motion. Now you will notice that we chose to focus on maximum displacement here. And that is because of the idea of equivalent static force, which is expressed by the equation here. Equivalent static force F sub S is expressed as simply the stiffness of the structure times its displacement. This means that by extension, we can express important design quantities such as base shear and overturning moment also in terms of displacement itself. And since we usually care about the maximum of these values, then really all we need to know is the maximum u. This is why the maximum displacement u-max is such a useful quantity to extract from the response time history. Another important quantity related to displacement is this idea of pseudo-acceleration. Now, pseudo-acceleration can be obtained directly from the equation for equivalent static force. We simply replace k with m times omega n squared, and then we name this new variable a as the product of the natural frequency squared times u. And this a is what we call pseudo-acceleration. Pseudo-acceleration is a useful quantity for relating forces to mass instead of stiffness.
However, it is important to note that the pseudo acceleration is not equal to the acceleration response unless damping is zero. This is because damping introduces a relative phase delay between displacement and acceleration, meaning that the acceleration will not necessarily peak at the same time as the displacement response. So it is important to think of pseudo acceleration simply as a convenient way of scaling U, but not actually having any relationship to the acceleration. For this reason, it is called pseudo acceleration. Now the next question is how do we display U max and A in a way that makes it easy to extract these response parameters for any type of structure? And that's the question that the response spectra will answer and is the topic of the next video.